Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Minouf Shafiq, and I'm the director of the London School of Economics. And it's a great honor for me to welcome Muhammad Yunus to the LSE today. Not many people would give up their Saturday night to come and hear a lecture. <laughs> and as Muhammad said to me in the green room, it's not exactly like I'm a rock star, but he sort of is. <laughs> I don't have my guitar. <laughs> Forgot it. He is, of course, as you know, a Nobel Prize winning economist recognized as a pioneer <clears throat> in the field of microfinance. In 1983, he founded Grameen Bank, which demonstrated that a model, a new model of finance for the poor and, and proved that the poorest and especially poor women could be credit worthy. Since then, microfinance has spread to over 100 countries all around the world. Today, Mohammed Yunus secures, tries to secure his vision of eradicating poverty through the Yunus Center, which looks to advance opportunities for the poor through research between the relationship between social business and health improvements. This evening, he's going to talk about his new book, A World of Three Zeros, The New Economics of Zero Poverty, Zero Unemployment, and Zero Carbon Emissions in which Dr. Yunus explores ways to fix the issues of the current capitalist system. His innovative ideas brought, uh, brought forward a new model of finance and even gave banking a good name. Can he do this for capitalism? That is what we will learn tonight. For those of you using Twitter in the audience, the hashtag for today's event is, is, LS, is hashtag LSE Eunice, and I'd ask you to turn your phones off. Uh, at, the end, at the end of his speech, we will be taking questions, and there will be an opportunity to get his book signed uh, as well. So with that, let me turn to Muhammad Yunus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, just to start with uh, picking up something you said, I give banking a good name. Do I? <laughs> I thought I'd give the banking a bad name because no. doing something which uh, they don't do. So I thought they should be doing that. Even after 41 years of our work, it's still uh, microcredit or microfinance, whichever you want to call it. Uh, it's a footnote in the banking system. It's not a mainstream. That's a complaint that I keep making. I hope. They hear it, <coughs> they change it, because that's the crux of everything that I have done. Uh, everything emerged from that. Uh, they were saying it cannot be done. I said, well, let's try, why not? And it all started because there's a lot of loan sharking in the village next to the university where I was teaching. And this was a very drastic, uh, painful economic situation in Bangladesh back in the early 70s. And I was trying to say, I was teaching economics in the campus, in the university. Um, and uh, I felt bad that uh, such a terrible situation that people uh, starve in the next village. And here we are talking about the brilliant theories of economics. So I thought maybe I should do something to see if I'm, as a person, useful. Because subject that I teach is a useless subject anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> so why don't I go out, see if I can, as a person, uh, because my knowledge doesn't help it, whatever quote-unquote knowledge uh, doesn't help it. So why don't I try if personally as a human being I can be useful to somebody. I was trying to find usefulness in me because uh, it's something that I teach, I'm totally useless uh, in making my students uh, follow the same path of being useless. Why don't they do something? And it's a, it's a lot of anguish inside of you when you come to that kind of uh, situation. So I did a lot of tiny, tiny, tiny things in the village. Every day I go after the classrooms, talk to people. It's just next door, literally. Uh, <clears throat> then something I started noticing. Noticing the whole problem of loan sharking. Every day I hear stories about loan sharking, how one family, one person devastated, lost everything because he borrowed tiny little money from somebody else. And he took advantage of it, grabbed everything in the name of loan condition. I felt terrible, and I said that my entire life that I have spent in learning economics never told me what to do with the loan sharks. Uh, this is a genuine problem of people, uh, but 
there's nothing that they have given me as a tool to address that. So I was kind of feeling terrible inside of me. And suddenly it caused, come to me that uh, I can do something, at least for these few people in the village. Why don't I start lending money myself? So I don't have to have a design of a research project or uh, do three, three year research and finally put a journal article someplace. I said, why just go there and do the lending so that when you lend the money, people can come to you, they don't have to go to the loan shark. The problem for those few people will be solved. And that's what encouraged me. Immediately I started doing that. And people responded very enthusiastically. If you get money, who doesn't get interested? <laughs> <laughs> and I interpreted it as he must be doing something good to those people that I'm lending money to. And it became very popular. Moving forward again and again, they're taking loans, paying me back. And I continued to expand it and to uh, next village and next village. Then I saw my money is running out. Uh, it's all my personal money. And I thought, what would happen if my money runs out? I can still run it, but a very limited way. People are paying back, I can reuse the money. But I, the demand is so much, I need fresh money. So that's when I thought about banking. Went to the bank, bank refused it. They said it cannot be done. I said it can be done, I'm doing it. So it's a long story. <laughs> uh, I don't want to go through the whole thing again. Uh, I've told that story many times. Uh, what I did finally, I said, why don't I create my own bank? Forget about this bank. This bank will never do anything for poor people. They are sealed their mind to not to do it. Uh, so I st uh, tried to have a separate bank for the poor people. That itself created a lot of opposition. How could you have a poor bank for the poor people? But finally, we got it through. In, started in 1976, we became a formal bank in 83. Today, we have nine million borrowers in that bank called Grameen Bank, Village Bank. Grameen means village. And there's this full reason why we called it Grameen Bank. Because banks not only don't lend money to poor people, they don't function in the villages. So we said, this is a bank we make which works only in the village. It will never go to the city. 41 years later, since we began, still we don't work in any city, any town in Bangladesh. We're always in the village. The more remote you are, more attractive you are. That's the philosophy that we had. Uh, and we have nine million borrowers now, mostly women, 97% women. And we lend out uh, last year over two and a half billion dollars worth of Bangladeshi currency. And repayment record remained very high, 99%, 98%, never fell below. And this bank is owned by them. They sit in the board, they make the decisions, and so on. And that idea has spread around the world. Uh, latest one that we are very, uh, very happy about, one that started in uh, USA, in uh, Jackson Heights. First branch was done, it's called Grammy in America. First branch was located in Jackson Heights. It was a challenge given to me because I was saying, it, People were explaining to me it will never work in the United States because we tried in many, many ways, hundreds of ways we tried in different parts of the country. None of them work. Then I told them, you can work uh, thousands of times and every time you fail, I will still say it can, it, be, it can be done. They were very surprised. That how come we fail and you keep saying that it can be worked? How come we fail then? I said, simple reason. You didn't know how to do it. <laughs> so if you do it right, it will work. Then somebody got very upset on that. He stood up from the crowd. He said, if you're so sure, why didn't you come and do it yourself? Show us. I said, I'd love to do that, but I can't bring money from Bangladesh to lend money here. <laughs> so if you promise to give the money, put the money on the table and I'll be in action. So literally they met me after the conference, said, yes, how much money you need? So we calculate together, said X amount, and they said, I'll put the money on the table and you come. I said, you put the money and I'll be there. So that's how it began in 2008, January, in Jackson Heights. Now there are 20 branches of Grammy in America, all over the United States. Uh, we started, there are nine branches in New York City and other branches in uh, Jackson, in uh, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Omaha, Nebraska, Charlotte, North Carolina, Miami, and so on. 20 branches in various parts of the country. Today they serve over 100,000 borrowers all women, 100% women, most of them undocumented women, 
the so down there is not any identity. Not only we lend money without collateral, we had a grand experience, we, not, we do it with the undocumented, unidentified women who has no identity for themselves. We had no problem. Repayment has remained in the last nine, 10 years now that we have lent is remaining 99.5% and above. Never faltered. No matter which location you're talking about, still the same. So they have given over a billion dollar loan now. A startup loan will be somewhere close to $1,500. With $1,500, they can change their life. And they, none of them have any credit score in the USA. I don't know how is it here. Credit score is like your life. You, you are nobody if you don't have a credit score. Uh, they start with zero uh, credit score and move on to 600, 700 credit score in, uh, in no time. So they buy, establish their credit stories and credit identification right away. Not that they're going to get any money from anybody. Nobody will give, <coughs> give them money, but they feel proud that they have the credit score. So this is the kind of thing. This is spreading and so on. While we are doing that in microcredit, we got uh, interested and got sucked into many other issues because we are together working with the poor people. And we, create, we wanted to address those issues, like we did the loan sharking issue. Then we wanted to see how we can do that, addressing issues of healthcare. First one, to do our attention as a healthcare, because children, because children are malnourished, uh, one thing. And one common problem that we saw, night blindness at that time in Bangladesh in early 70s. Uh, I couldn't understand why they are night blind. And uh, what happens, they, everybody explained to me this uh, shortage of, uh, 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 it's a lack of vitamin E, vitamin A deficiency. So I came up with an idea to promote vegetable because vegetables have lots of vitamin A, to make them sure that they enjoy uh, vegetables, feed the children vegetables. Uh, tried many times, but didn't work. People didn't pay much attention to it. Then it started selling vegetable seeds to our network of Grameen uh, workers and so on. And it's such a good seed, and we made a penny packet, one penny per packet, and uh, staff of Grameen Bank, while they go to do their job in the villages, they carry this basket and start selling. People find it very interesting to pay a penny and get a packet of uh, seeds. It became very popular. As Grameen Bank grew, our business grew. At one time, we became the largest seed seller in the whole country, vegetable seed seller in the country. By that time, night blindness disappeared in the country. So we felt very encouraged that it's not doctor, it's not anything. All we could do just set vegetable seeds, encourage people to sprinkle it around their homes so that they can get vegetables. It doesn't need lots of efforts. But they started enjoying it, making it. It's a food item, and the people are short of food anyway. So it helped them. So that encouraged us to do many things. Sanitation, they didn't have any toilets anywhere in the country, in the villages. They would just go out in this, uh, out anywhere. Uh, and now we explained that this uh, breeds diseases, spread diseases. Uh, you're sick all the time because of this. Your children are sick because of that. Who cares? So in early on, when we no noticed that, what we did, we created a, a moment, to create a momentum, what we did, we made a rule in Grameen Bank. If you want to join Grameen Bank, by that time, Grameen Bank became attractive to women and in the villages. So if you want to join Grameen Bank, you have to dig a hole and use it. You can't go anywhere you want. There was a lot of resistance. But something good happened to us. The older borrowers who were already in the system, who didn't have to go through this, uh, they, anybody who would come to them for advice, how do I get into Grameen Bank? How, how do I borrow money from them? They said, you know what? First, dig a hole. <laughs> if you don't do that, they are not going to talk to you. If you do that, they will be very happy to talk to you. So they became our ambassadors, continue to do that and it could continue to expand and so on and so forth. And as a result, it became an integral part of Grameen Bank system. That uh, if you join Grameen Bank, you have to have a pit latrine. And then we introduced the sanitary latrine. It cost money to start producing. We created a separate business to produce it in the village so that you don't have to carry from a long distance. And we give her a loan so that she can go and pay them and they can install it for you and you have a very nice sanitary latrine for yourself. They feel very good about it. Uh, 
started using it. Now we have nine million families, I just told you. Every person who is in Grameen Bank has to have a sanitary latrine. So all of them have sanitary latrine. It's part of our system. Now that it's in the system, they are doing it. There's a tremendous pressure right from the beginning among the well-off families in the village. They don't have latrine at all, just like any other village. You may hire up in the income, but there is no toilet. Uh, so there's a pressure building up in those families. Their women in those families will accuse their male folks in the, in the family. Even the beggar woman has a toilet. We don't have any toilet because it's very painful for them to wait until the darkness of evening comes so that they can go out unless you, you, you cannot do, men can do anything they want, but not women. They have to wait for the darkness. And that's a very painful experience for anybody. So they put lots of pressure in the family because they see that these poor families have them, but they don't have it. So today, sanitation is a common thing in Bangladesh. It's Bangladesh way ahead, way ahead from many other countries around the region. So these are the things that we did. Every time I saw a problem, I create a business to solve it. I did the SID business. It was a business. I didn't want it to become a burden on the bank by spending money on this. So I created this. I said I could have done it by charity. If I had done it by charity, then uh, it will go a little bit. But it cannot reach millions of people. So I thought, why don't I do it a business way? So that money comes back, I can use the money. And that's the kind of thing we created. A series of them, now nearly 60 companies we created over time, with those same features. Only business to solve a specific problem. And I got into lots of controversy. I always create controversy, so this is nothing new for me. I said, oh, this is not a business. If you're not making money, how can it be business? I said, why did they say that you have to make money personally to be a business? A business is something which is sustainable. You sell a product, you sell a service, you get your money back, you have a surplus. Who takes the surplus? That's not part of the business. No, 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 no. You have to maximize your personal profit. That's what the book says. I said, book is wrong. <laughs> Forget it. I said, is there a law in Bangladesh? that if I run a business, if I make money, I have to take it, otherwise I'll be in jail. I said, there is no such law, I'm doing it. I keep the money to plow it back into the business because whole business is to solve problem, not to make money for myself or anybody else. So it became a big controversy for me, everybody saying, oh, he does crazy thing, this is another crazy thing he did, and he's trying to promote it, which doesn't have any chance. Why should anybody do business not to make money. I said, whoa, this is, this is a crazy idea. I said, look, if you call this a crazy idea, giving, uh, creating a business is not to make money personally and only to solve problems, and you think somebody has to be really crazy to do something like that. I said, people do worse than that. They give away their money. I'm getting my money back. In social business, the investor can take back the money that they invested. After that, he or she doesn't take any penny for himself because the whole business is dedicated to solving problems. I said, you cannot call me crazy. Before You have to call other people crazy. They are crazier than me. They just give it away. I'm getting my money back. So this continues. Where is the incentive for this business? Who will do this business? You took away the central part of business. Central essence, the essence of business is to make profit. And that is the incentive which pro kind of goes on and in big waves to make it more and more. This is the central thing about business. You remove that incentive of making money, the whole business collapses. There is no business left. I said, I totally agree with you. I have no problem with that. Only thing I disagree with you, you said that is the incentive in business. There I this kind of contest. I said, this is a very powerful incentive. I agree with that. But there are other incentives, maybe more powerful than that. So like what? So I give my answer in my way. I said, look, making money is a happiness. That's why that became an incentive. Making money is a happiness. Making other people happy is a super happiness. <laughs> you got it. 
So that's my incentive. I get super happiness by doing that. Can you stop me? Oh, you're very small. I said, maybe small, maybe not. You simply didn't give any space in your theoretical framework. That's why it doesn't work. If you open that up, it's completely different thing happen. Because you teach the economics student, the business is to maximize profit. That's where your system went wrong. It went in a different way. And I keep explaining like I did about the microfinance. I keep explaining that fundamental things about poverty. Poverty is not created by poor people. I have been working many, many times, many years, and I'm totally convinced there is nothing wrong with the poor people. So I said poor, po poverty is not created by the persons, the poor persons. Poverty is an imposed phenomenon. It's not self-generated phenomenon. It doesn't come from the poor people. It is imposed from outside. Poverty is created by the system, not by the persons. That changes everything. If then you start looking at the system, where is this hiding inside the system? I said, very simple. Look at the financial institutions. Half the population of the entire world is outside their rich. They will never care to do that. They are so busy taking care of the rich. I said, I, I, I called our bankers in Bangladesh when I was doing that. You run a very funny institution called bank. Bank is supposed to lend money to people. But you do it in such a funny way. You lend money to people who already have lots of money. <laughs> and you don't lend money to people who don't have money. I said, the logic will always tell you, you start with lending money by to the people who don't have money. That's a logical thing to do, rational thing to do. You do the totally rational thing. They laughed. They said, no, no, that's not banking. I said, no, this is not banking. So this the, that controversy began. I said, for people, any human being, financial services is like economic oxygen. Like if you don't have the oxygen in this room, we cannot breathe. <coughs> We get sick, we, get, we collapse because there's no oxygen. I said, that's what happens in people's life if you don't provide the economic oxygen. They become weak, they can dysfunctional, they collapse, and that's what we call poverty. You connect them with the financial oxygen, they become alive, they become active, they become enterprising. That's what happens when you connect them with the microcredit. This is the whole thing. So it's the system fault, it's not the person's fault. So I continue to argue that, and I argue that your basic system that we call capitalism is based on the absolutely wrong premise, definition of a human being. In the cap capitalist theory, cap a capitalist man is defined as a person who is driven by self-interest. He maximizes his self-interest in participating in the economic activity. I said, that's where you went wrong. You misinterpreted human being in the theory, and you got a wrong theory out of it. You, you force everybody to become selfish, self-interest-driven human being. You make the human being so narrow, so small. Human being is much bigger than that. Human being is driven by self-interest as well as selfless interest. You completely isolated and kind of threw away the whole idea of selflessness. At the moment you define a human being as both selfish and selfless, whole thing you have to redo again. You have already done the selfless part of it, you never touched the selfless part of it. I said, what I have done, what I now call self, self, selfless business, a business to solve problem without any intention of personally benefiting from it. In selfish business, everything is for me, nothing for others, nothing for anybody. In selfless business, everything is for others, nothing for me. This is just a reverse, selfish and selfless. So what I created is a selfless business. And I, then it became very big controversy, whether it's real, whether it's just a kind of utopian idea. So I have to give it a name so that debate can proceed. We call it social business. Give it a definition saying it's a non-dividend company to solve human problems. 
Investor can take the money back, whatever invested, nothing more than that, because he is not interested in taking money. His entire attention is solving problem. Once you be, bring the idea of business in solving problem, suddenly you become very powerful thing. So only thing you have in your theory, the capitalist theory, to address the problem is the charity. You make a lot of money and give away money. That's what you have. I said I admire those philanthropists, those charity people. They gave, do great things. That's why we survived so far out of charity. Otherwise, we'd be long gone. Many, many people would be leaving, couldn't survive. Charity has helped us over years. I said charity has a small problem. Limitation, I should say. Limitation is charity money goes out, does a wonderful work, but it doesn't come back. You have one time use of your money. What I have done, what I call social business, what I have done, I took the objective of charity, put a business engine behind it, and suddenly it becomes very powerful. Money goes out, solves the problem, and it comes back. It's amazing. Then you can use it again and again and again. It never exhausts itself, and it grows because you create surplus in the process, and it becomes, it is a, process by which you not only it doesn't disappear, it starts growing. And you create an institution. Charity doesn't create an institution. But this becomes an institution which is self-growth. It continues to grow. So this charity money has one life. Social business money has endless life. That's what we're calling the power, that's directing the power of it. So we created over 60 such companies in Bangladesh. Some are nationwide companies. And they just started drawing attention to other people. Fascinating thing that happened when we draw attention of the multinational companies. We didn't expect that multinational company would receive. We think they are blocked mind, they do all the things they know, they sniff money, nothing else. They are put like everybody else in the society. They are all fitted in our capitalist system. We are all fitted with the glasses with dollar signs. We see dollars, nothing else. I said, I'm all I'm asking, take the dollar sign glasses out put a social business glasses. Suddenly you see things which you never saw before. And we are very happy to have that and we tried it out whether this is a kind of a promotional thing they want to do, look, it's a look good kind of thing. We saw that no, they look genuine. So we created a company, a social business company jointly with Danone, a French company, to address the problem of malnutrition in the country. So it became very popular. What we did, a yogurt, fortified with all the micronutrients which are missing in the children, uh, like um, um, all the vitamin, iron, zinc, iodine, all, all this stuff into it, and make it very cheap. Once you go into the social business, suddenly your production process becomes different. You are not looking to frills anymore. You are not trying to draw attention to yourself, pay it more than what it deserves. You know, come to the basic, and all the costs become simpler and simpler. So we make it cheap, make it available, make a new marketing system so that we can reach to the poor. So that has spread in many, many different directions. Then something kept pushing myself. I said, my God, this is not only simply this, uh, it's not working for the poor people, the banking, not only the business is only for making money. Something terrible happened to the whole world. Concentration of wealth. We are talking about the poverty alleviation on the one side, and the other side we are stacking up with money with a few people. And I quote Oxfam uh, statements, the eight people in the world own more wealth than the bottom 50% of the people. That's today. Tomorrow it will be less. And day after it will be still less. In a, in a couple of years we'll have a situation where one person will be wanting more wealth than the bottom 50%. Because it's becoming faster and faster process. So if you try to imagine, it's a whole capitalist system is a sucking machine. Take all the wealth from the bottom and send it to the top. And top becomes a huge big mushroom, if you can imagine a big mushroom. And that mushroom is growing at a very fast speed every day. And it's being owned by fewer and fewer people every day. So where are we? This it has a stem hanging from there. The mushroom has a stem. That stem becoming thinner and thinner, slimmer and slimmer. 
And that's where 99.9% .9 people have the wealth, that slim little thing that, and we call it an economy. I said, this is a mockery. This is not economy. We go around kind of uh, pounding the glory of capitalist system. This is what it does. I said, just find out. And one statistics which was repeated during the US election, one family in the US, just one family in the US, had more wealth than the bottom 40% of the population of the US. Can you imagine that? And it will get worse because the system is sucking up and giving the money to the people who already have lots of money because that's what the principle of all the institutions we built. So where are we? And I said, this is a ticking time bomb. If it continues, it will produce so much anger inside the people. They said, we are just sucking our thumb. We don't know what's going on. We have nothing, they have everything. And that economy cannot function. I said, if you are genuinely interested in the future of mankind as we live in this world, have to step out of this. How do we reduce, this is a home task for you. How to reduce the speed of wealth concentration? Forget about the concentration, so just reduce the speed because it is now touched almost at the exponential level. <coughs> Going so fast, because in the past, it would take a lifetime to see a change of concentration. Now it takes one year, couple of years, to see sudden big change. What is happening? And then we say that this is a global phenomenon, we said, that 8% have more wealth than the bottom 50%. It's not just one country. You say country by country, almost a reflect, reflection of that. But you look geographically, 99% of the wealth probably is concentrated in four or five countries. 99% of the wealth of the entire world. Go and do your calculation. What is the rest of the world doing? Sucking their thumb. They work hard and say we are doing beautiful capitalist system, helping all our problems, solving. This is what it does. How do you stop that process? Because otherwise, this is going to explode. It's a matter of time. You cannot sustain this system forever. I said, well, what we have been doing, maybe that makes sense. We have at least done something. I said, maybe other people have other bright idea to stop it, but definitely this one is not going to work. This has to stop today. You cannot wait for that. So what is happening? When we say everybody can create a social business, in social business, there is no wealth concentration. Can you, do you figure that out? Because I'm not taking any, profit out of that business. So there is no concentration. There is no channel by which individuals become owner of the wealth. Businesses retain that, but businesses use it to solve problems. So it is a machine which you create solving problems all the time. So you are reducing problems of poverty, whatever problem you have, environment, etc., etc. You're doing that, but at the same time, you're not taking wealth. So to that extent, wealth concentration is reduced. That part of the economy is, doesn't contribute to the wealth. Then another thing happened, and this came in a process, again, working with the Grameen borrowers, this time their children. We encouraged them to have good education, their parents are totally illiterate. So we said we stop illiteracy in the mother's generation and their parents' generation. But their children must be educated. So we made sure children of all these nine million families go to school, have good education, as good as it's available in the, in the country, but have education. They did. We gave them education loan, we gave them scholarships so that everybody can go to school, stay in school. So we have a huge gener second generation coming up with education, but they keep complaining. No job in the country. What do we do? Why did you send us to school? I had no immediate response. I was puzzled. What do you do with it? Suddenly I realized something. And I started questioning them. Why are you looking for a job? Who said you have to have a job? Is it your teacher? Is it your book? Of course, they cannot answer that question. This is a silly thing to ask. They said, this guy is going crazy again. <laughs> <laughs> then I say, job is a wrong, obsolete idea. Not only wrong, it's an obsolete idea. It should have stopped in the last century. Somehow it sneaked in. <laughs> now your job is to remove that thought from your mind and replace with the new thought. 
and tell yourself again and again. Every morning you wake up, you repeat it 100 times. I'm not a job seeker, I'm a job creator. Think like a job creator, behave like a job creator, and you become a different person. If you're a job seeker, you become a smaller person. You're at the mercy of other people. So why should you be at the mercy of other people? Then they kept saying, oh, we don't know how to do business. They didn't teach us how to do business. I said, that's shame on you. You remember your mother? When she joined Grameen Bank, maybe 20 years, maybe 30 years back, she joined Grameen Bank. Your illiterate mother had the courage to come to the, to the bank people to say, I want a loan to start a business. And she did. And ever since she's paying back and taking another loan, another loan, and she sent you to school. That's where you're born. You are telling me your illiterate mother can become an entrepreneur, can start a business, and you have all your education. You say, I don't know anything about business. I don't know where to start. I say, shame on your education, which wiped out completely your ability to think on your own and to create an entrepreneur by yourself, out of yourself. I said, all these nine million borrowers that we have, every single one of them is an entrepreneur. And all the borrowers all around the world of microcredit, they're all entrepreneurs. They're not job, job applicants. I said, this is in our blood. Simply your education system has wiped it out completely. Did a clean job on that one so that you can work for somebody else. Because capitalist system needs it, needs the fodder to system, keep the system alive. We are complaining about the concentration of the wealth. You know what you're doing? You become the mercenaries for that. You work for those people so that they can make money. If you didn't work for them, they will not have a concentration. I said, why don't you just start your own business? I said, we don't have business ideas. I said, okay, you go back to your mother. Find out how she had the business idea. Your illiterate mother who never crossed the boundary of her village. She has no Wi-Fi, no cell phone. They have cell phone now. <laughs> <laughs> but she didn't have any access to Googles and so on and so forth. And she became an entrepreneur. She didn't consult anybody or consult her friends only to find out. She didn't go to school to learn how to start a business. Why don't you go back and learn from her instead of going to the school, which you have done a bad job on you, destroyed you completely. So be yourself, again, reborn. As I said, it is in our DNA. Entrepreneurship is in our DNA. When we are in the caves, we are not sending job applications. Cave number five to cave number 10. <laughs> what kind of job you have for me? We didn't ask. If we did ask, we'll be finished. We'll be dead. Luckily, we didn't ask. We did our own thing. We survived. We battled with the world. We battled with the circumstances and survived. And that's where we are. Human beings are go-getters. That's its basic identity. Human beings is a creative being. That's its basic identity. Job cuts off creativity. That's end of creativity. Job is end of creativity. Why are you looking for that? You are a giant of a human being and get into a little slop in an office. And you are supervised by a mini supervisor above you. And that's what your world would be. That's how you'll be. You gave up all your creative power for the sake of living for, making a living for yourself. That's not human being is born for. Human being is born to unleash its creative, his creative capacity to contribute to the world. That's what the human being is. That's what you're an entrepreneur. Now what we do, we create social business venture capital. And tell the young people, come with a business idea. We will invest in your business. We become your partner. It's not a loan, it's an investment. Your job is to make success, make success of your business. Once you are successful, just return the money to us, what we gave you. We are not interested in our profit because we are social business. You can make money for yourself, that's your business. But since we are social business, our job is to make sure we launch you on the orbit of creativity. That's all our job. In the beginning, they were hesitant, what kind of business, how do we do it? Now they have learned. Every month we have thousands of young people coming up business ideas, we keep on investing and investing and investing, and they start businesses. Just like the microcredit, which we did in the beginning, people are hesitant. Now it becomes a wave. 
So these young people are turning themselves into entrepreneurs. No problem. We have no terrible crisis. What happens? We had big flood, but it's still our business is running. Like microcredit is running, their business is running too. People knew how to cope with the odds in the society, odds in the uh, environment and so on, so that they have to survive, they have to continue. So this is, now I make it, this is something very important for us to turn into entrepreneurs. I said, as the children grow up in the family, we should be giving them option. You have two options in your life. You can be an employee of some organization, or you can be an entrepreneur yourself. Today, that option is not available. We tell the young people in schools, in colleges, in education system, decide what you want to be. Would you like to be an employee, a job seeker, or you want to be an entrepreneur? It's, both are available to you. Today, that option doesn't exist. And that's why we created the whole problem that we have, the wealth concentration. I said, if you want to address that issue, we have to redesign the problem of uh, interpretation of a human being as a selfish and selfless, interpretation of a human being, whether he should be employee or he should be an entrepreneur, or give them the option. Once you put that, wealth concentration will disappear. And then the last point I want to make, we talk about the job creation. Every politician say, if you vote for us, we'll create so many jobs. So many jobs have been created. This is standard uh, menu for them. They keep on repeating this. Where is the job? Artificial intelligence is coming. How long will it take? Today's newspaper said by 2020, they have signed an agreement with Uber, with NASA, that they will start this uh, uh, taxi cab service in three cities in the USA which is autonomous taxis, no driver. This is humble beginning of artificial intelligence. Soon all the trucks in the USA and Europe will be running with autonomous uh, capacity, no driver. So this is one. I was told by the very big high power technology people, your business in Bangladesh will be over because technology is getting ready for that. I said, how come? I said, because of your garment industry. We have the garment industry. This is our number one uh, export. 80% of our export is in gar by garment. And it says it will take 10 to 15 years. You will not have any garment industry left because artificial intelligence will produce it. You don't need human beings. I said, we'll have factories with 10, where 10,000 people are working. Soon in 10 to 15 years, there'll be 10 people running that factory not 10,000, because artificial intelligence will take over. If it is even half true, this is the path that we are going. It may take, he said, 15 to 10 to 15, it may be 15 to 20, but it starts happening. And where are our future? What is the future of the world? We have a job, not, this is not unemployed people anymore. These are people who are decently employed and suddenly walking in the street, they have no job left. Why? Because all artificial intelligence is driven by profit maker. They want to minimize their cost, and in their calculation, you are the one that they can cut the cost to cut you off the scene. And what you do, line up in the counter for the welfare benefit, because that's the only survival process. Because nobody's going to hire you anymore. Everybody who is supposed to hire, they will be getting their artificial intelligence rather than you. So this is what is coming. And then I raise the question, can artificial intelligence do anything they want? The producers, the designers, the fund, uh, investors, they wish to do anything for the world? It cannot be done. I said, look, when you produce a medicine, you are familiar with that. Pharmaceutical companies do lots of research to produce one little medicine ultimately, which would be helpful in addressing your health problem. That takes years. Once they finally made it, they got to it. What do they have to do? They rush to the market? They cannot. They have to go to a regulatory body. To demonstrate again and again, convince the regulatory authority, it will not have any side effect harmful to the people. They will be acceptable side effects, but not the one that will be more harmful than benefit. And you wait and wait to see what will be the verdict. If they say no, you have no, 
way you can put the market. I said, can the uh, 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 technology people just walk out and say you have no jobs and there's no voice to say it is right for the people or wrong for the people? I said, the first thing to do is to create similar regulatory authority to check all the technology that people are producing. Give the clearance that whether you can, you can do it because you'd be damaging the people's life, whether you can do it or you can't do it. We don't have that because the profit makers are so busy with that. So can you imagine what is happening now? Concentration of wealth, getting in fewer and fewer hands. There's those fewer hands now control the economy and they will control more of the economy because of the artificial intelligence. And they, in, in order, because they own the wealth, they also, wealth is the power. So they have the power. They have the power, political power. They have the economic power. They have the social power. They have the media power. So you have to battle with that too. And then you have another political power, global political power. You have the nukes. You have the uh, atomic energy, the nuclear energy. Nuclear energy, sorry, nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons, again, another technology to kill people. There was no regulatory authority, international regulatory authority, whether you can make a bomb or not. They merrily created their bomb. Now they're stacked with all those bombs around. Since you have the bomb to destroy the world many times over, everybody's afraid of you. You have the monopoly of the political power. Your voice counts because you have the big bomb in your in few countries particularly two countries, have all those bombs. Other little countries have all the little bombs too, but they are as powerful as anybody else's bomb. So they call the tune. So you have the political power concentrated in few hands, you have the economic power concentrated. And these two powers coincide. If you look at the whole world, you'll see those who control this power, they also control the political power other way. This is the world we have created. So we have to go back to the root of why we did that and address that issue. Then I tried to address this issue. That's the context of the book that I have written and it's published a couple of weeks back in London. It's called A World of Three Zeros. An economy of three zeros, zero poverty, zero unemployment, zero net carbon emission. We can achieve that. There are ways to do that. That's the explanation that I did and how to address the problem on wealth concentration, and make, take it from there. If we can achieve that in a very near future, and it can be done in a near future, it doesn't have to be a very long future, once you make up our mind. It's all in our mind, what we want. Theory has blocked our mind. We want to unblock that. We can create the way we want, not the way theory wants. That's the distinction. We decide what kind of world we want, and I put these three zeros at this is what we want as a kind of simple framework. I said, if you can establish three zeros, if it happens, really, there's no unemployment. And I even say, not only there'll be no unemployment, the very word unemployment will, demand, will get unemployed <laughs> because it has no meaning anymore. Well, who do you call unemployed? Well, what is this? What do you say that? So that's the kind of scenario. Once we do that, this will be a transition point from the present civilization, which we have, a greed-based civilization. We transit from the greed-based civilization to a human value-based civilization, where we will create a completely new structure of the society because nobody is superior than anybody else. Thank you very much. there will be a lot of questions. <laughs> uh, if you could raise your hand and uh, one of the microphones will come to you, sit, let us know what your name is and ask a question. Let's start with the gentleman here and then let's go to the top. We've got two over there. In the Hi. Hi, I'm Felipe. And you know, thank you very much because your ideas really transformed my life five years ago and I am really admire and really believe in the social business way of doing things. And actually my question would be, how do you think it's more effective for it to gain scale and to be a very uh, a massive change in human mindset to talk about economics. Because I've, I've been following very closely for the past five years. And unfortunately, I see it's growing, but it's growing very slowly. There is still a huge gap for us to 
be big and to make it really in a big scale. So I'd love to hear what, what you've seen that's very effective to make this bigger, please. Well, thank you for uh, paying attention to it. And I see a lot of young people already got into it and designing their social businesses. I said, uh, designing social business doesn't cost any money, but it's very powerful. All you have to do, design a business, any problem that you see around you, design a business to solve a slice of that problem. Don't try to solve it overnight, the entire problem. That's the wrong path. Try to do one little thing at a time. Make the smallest bite-sized social business as possible. It's important because you're developing a prototype, you're developing a seed. When the seed is developed, you can plant it, and it becomes a forest. It becomes a big field full of those. So that's what you're doing, starting it. But the development of that prototype is the most important part which you are going through. Financing part, we have, in the book I've discussed what are the sources of finance and so on. Like you are interested in doing that, somebody is interested in finance that. How to connect them. Uh, crowdfunding, you know all this stuff. Crowdfunding is one. People get excited when you post it in your Facebook or wherever you want to put that so that everybody knows. Say, oh my God, it only takes, a, here is my $10, here are my $50, here are my $100. Like that. And you do that. And we have done that. And immediately you get the money. People respond to it and you get the money. And you get the next step. Make a bigger size. And, and we are, in the meantime, we are trying to create, encourage other people to create social business investment funds. Completely different one. And they are looking for you. They're waiting for you. Like in France, they have already created Credit Agricole. It's a, one of the largest banks in Europe. They created a Grameen uh, Credit Agricole Social Business Fund, waiting for business, the proposals to come so that they can invest. They are doing it uh, globally, invested in many countries already. And many others are coming gradually. They see that this is the way. Because sooner or later, everybody will know that this is, a, this is going to blow up anyway. So unless we have to, do, they have to do it very quick. So we're waiting for that, definitely. And there are also networks, young people's networks, business people's network, very top global business network aimed at social business. They, one of them, which is in France again, called Action Tank. Action Tank brings about a dozen uh, French companies together to discuss among them how to create social business, who is doing what social business design, check with each other, present in each other, so that they can start doing that themselves, so that they, it sips into their mind into it. So this is how it's working away. By the way, I should mention, I have a long-term relationship with the LSE. They gave me an honorary degree a few years back. <laughs> I and LSE also planted an in-house uh, High Commissioner of LSE in Grameen Center, uh, Yunus <laughs> Center, Lamia Murshed, where she was here. Yes, yeah, can you stand up? She's the head of uh, Yunus Center. She's a LSE graduate. So all the time. <laughs> so she's she's the honorary uh, High Commissioner for LSE. You know. <laughs> So she always reminds me what's happening in LSC, how we do it here. So I'm very familiar with everyday life with here. And I hope that, uh, and many others, young people came forward now, created a whole chunk of social business, uh, all LSE graduates. Just quit what she was working in uh, uh, with the Boston Consulting Group. She said, what am I doing here? It's helping people to make more money, I quit. So she started, <laughs> she started her social business. Now she has a network in several countries. So you get connected with those people to see how it is done. So this is a very integrated relationship that we have with LSE. Thank you, LSE graduates. Thank <laughs> you for that. Okay, let me take one up here. Yeah. Uh, hello, I'm Andrea Paletti, a PhD candidate in management here at LSE. Uh, what is the role of the state in this new economic perspective? The role of charity? The state. The role state. of the state, yeah, of course. Uh, one quick answer that I get, yes, state is very important. They have to uh, follow uh, rule of law. That's number one responsibility for that. Uh, good governance, that's very number one uh, responsibility. No corruption, which is now became integral part of governments. So how to stop corruption. These are the ingredients what creates the environment. They don't have to jump in to help you to define new law and so on. We said don't jump into it. Uh, if you jump into it, you'll probably it will get messed up. 
uh, because still you don't know exactly what legislation is needed. At the moment, we don't need any legislation. And we tell them not to support us with money or not to support us with the new um, kind of uh, privileges, that this is social business, so you don't have to pay taxes. You social business, so you don't have to do this, you don't have to do that. But our argument is, if you start doing that, giving us a special status, giving us special privilege, then the wrong people will start coming into social business <laughs> to take advantage of. Profit makers are very smart. They will sneak in any door they want <laughs> to take advantage of it. So I said, keep the door blocked so that we struggle our own way. And we'll make it happen because we feel it is strongly among us, within ourselves. And we tell them, tell them that you become the cheerleaders for the whole thing rather than be involved with it. This is one. Number two, we said, there are many things you do with charity. Why didn't you try to transform part of it into social business? Like you do welfare. You give people money every month so that they can sustain yourself. Can you create a social business to take 10 welfare people out of welfare in a business way? Not forcing them, making them so attractive they want to come and join you. Out of hundreds of thousands of welfare recipients you have, finding 10 people who are willing to jump out right away will not be a difficult part. But if you do that, you open up a floodgate. Many other people say, I'll do that. So that will be your responsibility, to make sure people don't have to rot in welfare. They get out and become a full human being and take care of themselves. That, this is a built-in capacity of every human being. So welfare is not the ultimate home for people. That may be temporary home under circumstances, but we have all the mechanism available so that we can help them ease them into the life, full life, creative life for themselves. That will be the best service we can do. Those are the things that a state can do. Well, I'm gonna inter interrupt myself here. What about in the transition to this new social business type of capitalism, would you advocate taxing, higher taxation for the wealthy to create more investment in education and welfare and a sort of more conventional economic policy during the transition? Or do you think that actually would be? Now, just to, this is the usual uh, thing that uh, uh, textbook kind of uh, solution to wealth concentration. You tax the rich heavily and take the money and the uh, state takes the money to tax revenue and use it for the people who are missed out. Two flaws. One. State, where is the state coming from? Where is the politics coming from? I just mentioned. Politics is controlled by those 99% uh, wealth owners. They don't let you behave the way you want. You want to take away from them? They will reverse it. They will do heavy tax for the poor, make it easy, because we are crea job creators. See, if you don't help us, we don't, can't create jobs. They claim they are the job creators. So, you have to finance them, they have to expand their business and make it easy for them. This is the usual argument you will hear. And even if you tax it, it will be a nominal tax increase. We are talking about 99% of the wealth. You cannot say you have to pay 90% uh, wealth tax or something like that. No, nothing will go through the parliament, nothing will go through, through that. They will make sure. Media is in that, their, their control, no matter what kind of media you've got. Uh, they are uh, probably they will be controlling the social media too. Already they control social media too. So this is the fear that the, you cannot really come to that level if you want. In a significant way, the way it is going, you counter that. Number two is state got all the money. What does the state do? Charity? You have to define what is the use of the government taking money. Welfare system? Give charity? Change? Charity doesn't solve problems. Charity only maintains the problem. If you address the problem, you have to unleash the capacity of the individual human being. There's no other option. We have it all packed up inside of us. Simply, system has not allowed us to express that idea. So these are the two things we have to resolve. But you keep trying. I'm not objecting to that. I'm just pointing out the limitation of it. In the meantime, create social businesses. And ask people to create social businesses, encourage them to create social businesses. Uh, you don't force social business. Social business has to come from your heart. Change your education system before you change the government. That's where the, the root of, of the all problems is in our education, what we teach young people. I said in our business school, we teach young people to become smart, learn all the tricks of the business. To do what? 
to go out and work for a business company to make money for their shareholders. That's our life dedicated to. That's what we call business school. I said, if you are going to do that, you, why don't you have a different degree also simultaneously, a social MBA. You train young people how to design a social business, how to run a social business, where to find the money for the social business. If you're hired by a social business, how to make it more efficient. You don't have it. So it's an empty field. So I said, why didn't you do that? Then social businesses will grow because you bring all your expertise into these young people who go out and do it. These two businesses are so different. One is trying to make money. Another is going to no money at all. We are not interested in money. Even to take this person to run a social business has a highly risky job. Only thing he knows how to make money. He doesn't know how to not make money, how to solve problems. He said, I don't have any in the textbook how to solve problems. I'm always told I'm an expert in how to make money for the company. That's what I'm trained for. So we have to train somebody else, a different one. That's why education system becomes the core of the whole thing. Thank you. Up here. Um, thank you, Dr. Yunus, for a very inspirational speech. Um, on a personal... Introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Preeti. Um, on a personal note, where do you get this energy and enthusiasm and this absolute determination from given you must have faced tremendous problems in in your um, awesome. endeavors and on a related note um, what is your source of inspiration who are your role models thank you well i thought i answered that question in the middle of my presentation i said making money is happiness <laughs> making other people happy is a super happiness so i'm gloating with super happiness <laughs> <laughs> I bubble with super happiness. <laughs> so it continues. <laughs> so p when people say, uh, you must be making a lot of money, I say, look, that's what the conventional idea of a business. Here I am in a business where I don't need any money, any penny. I said, not only that, personally, I don't own any share, any, any share in any company anywhere in the world. So I'm clean. I don't own any share, anything. So, so <laughs> I can dedicate myself into the, it's an exciting area. When you, I just mentioned it, just take it as a case example. If you can take five uh, welfare person out of welfare by creating a business, a social business, your interest is not to make money out of those people, your interest is to help them get out and be on their own by creating a business. It's not a rocket science. It takes only 10 minutes to design a business like that. It takes a small amount of money to invest that. Anybody can do that, anytime. But we don't do it. Because that's what, what we discussed in our classroom, in our education system. If I can do five people out of welfare, the whole door is open now. Nobody has to be in welfare. Because we know how to get them. And with enthusiasm, they will come out. It's all with, like, take five unemployed young people. There are lots of unemployed young people looking for a job. Many countries in Europe has 40% youth unemployment, 60% youth unemployment. Shame, young people not doing anything. And I said, look at that, how our theories have put into our mind. The young person, enterprising person, creative person, sitting there. Why? He said, I don't have a job. I applied, applied, applied. I was rejected. I said, can you imagine an active, super active human being with all the technology in hand, not doing anything? Something must have done by the theory that has put a spell on this young person. You cannot move anymore. Your mind cannot think anymore. That is the power of the thing that we teach in the classroom, that you become paralyzed. You cannot even think for yourself. We, if he had the thinking, he will go out and do something. There are many ways to do things. And as a social business, I can take these young people, three of them, five of them, turn them into entrepreneurs. That's what I said in Bangladesh. We had in thousands of young people coming with the business ideas. All we are doing is investing. And my position is if you put that money on the table, everybody in this room will become entrepreneur. But that money is not on the table. If a young person today goes out with a brilliant business idea to any bank, any investor, that I have a great idea, give me the money, I'll do it. They will say, get out of this premise. Who are you? Because our system is not built for that purpose. So we have to rebuild that purpose. That's the challenge. Okay, this gentleman here. David Danavi, King's College, London. Okay. Uh, here. Sorry. 
Oh, sorry. Oh, down there. I'm looking up. <laughs> because so many hands are there. I'm working on the next one. So, David, I'm Kick I'm. I really appreciated, well, yeah, the fantastic presentation, but also the the touching the um, drug discovery uh, process because I'm I'm a bit involved in drug discovery, and I think the cultural change is really key. So we we want an NHS system that is is kind of catering for the population in terms of health, but then we give up the the profit on the, the so the risk of drug discovery stands mostly on public funding because it comes from university mostly but then the profit is private so I think the culture is key but then the example you you, you did with artificial intelligence I was thinking of a thought experiment where a factory has a hundred workers and they come to you and propose to get artificial intelligence to just have the workers uh, working for four hours rather than 12 as they currently are so this would still be an improvement of the condition of the workers and I think blocking the technology is a risk of kind of blocking creative processes as well. So I think culture change is key, and, and, and what you're saying is, is an incredible example of achievement in this process, but I think blocking technology per se has also other risks of, of blocking the creativity process. All I'm saying, if you follow what I tried to explain, to block the wrong technology. If you are creating a nuclear bomb, I have the right to stop it. Absolutely. That's all I'm saying. See, the scenario that I was presenting to you, technology itself doesn't have a, its mind. It's the mind of the person which is transmitted to the technology. Who is this mind that passing on to this technology? There are two drivers of technology in the world. One is a money maker. He wants to make money. That's his sole interest. So he will do anything, invest any money, so that he can make more profit. His company becomes a global company, he owns everything, that's his drive. The, all the experts who are trained in the business school, they will go and help them to make it happen. So that's their focus. That, and he creates that artificial intelligence not to give four hours research for this. He is, uh, remove them, we have, if you can relieve them for four hours, I will relieve them forever. Why should I stop at four hours? You are thinking of a sane person designing. There is no sane person designing the technology. It is the money maker. His eyes has only dollar sign, nothing else. <laughs> he wants money. So he will not stop at that point. You are wishing that it will, it will not. He will go all the way and make it happen. In the beginning, maybe he will do it out of necessity because the technology has not sharpened enough yet to take over the whole thing. But his ultimate goal is to remove you completely. So one is the money maker who drives the technology. And it is a war maker who takes te technology. Both are in their hands, not good for us. So I'm saying, why don't we have social business person in the middle? Design so artificial intelligence to solve the problem of healthcare. We don't need doctors. Once we have the artificial intelligence doctor, the virtual doctors will be everywhere at your service, uh, through your mobile phone. Artificial intelligence. Whatever you have, he, the, the artificial intelligence monitor your body all the time. Keep check on you. And if there is any irregularity, he will be the first one to tell you you have irregularity here. You are eating too much of fast food. <laughs> you have to reduce it, then it will be okay. And they'll monitor, no, 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 you're not reducing it. You still have the same problem. So keep it, so that stopping the disease is the thing. Not curing the disease. Curing the disease is too far away. It's already complicated. You allow it to that, that hospitalization and all that. You don't have to. Our body completely every day is changing. And if it is changing the right way, it's okay. Artificial intelligence will not give you a star that you got a five star today. You did a good job. And you lose your star. Someday you do too much festivity, too much eating and so on. <laughs> you attending too much wedding. Whatever. So they will be monitored. It is possible if you have the social mind behind this technology design. And it could be costless. Today, healthcare is becoming more and more expensive every day because the money makers are driving the healthcare in the world. So if you remove that money makers, you put a social business in the seat, things completely change. Technology is already available. Simply, they will not allow you to use it because they want to make sure their business comes in. You have 
examples of medicine developed for a very important disease, but it's sold at an extremely high price and poor people cannot afford it. But the cost of production is tiny. He says, oh, I spent so much money on the developing, you have to pay for it. Who knows how much he paid, how much he spent, but he claims that. So if you have a social business pharmaceutical company, he just comes, he charges you the money that it really cost to him. So it changes completely. So it's all about what we have in mind. So if you give a free license to anybody, any technology, you get into this problem. So it's the right technology, of course, you will give them all the certification, you go ahead. But if it's the wrong technology, if you're creating a bomb or some explosive or something to destroy people's life, you are using a food industry where you've had a new technology, how to keep the food look fresh for one whole year because you add this little chemical here and it is the new technology they developed and you allow them, we destroy ourselves. So I have to go and stop, you cannot do that. You have to get our clearances, we have to investigate how it happens and so on. So at every step we have to see what it is. That's all I'm saying. Thank you. Okay, I'm afraid I'm going to have to take the last question here. Terribly sorry that I couldn't get to everyone. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Evelina and I study international migration at LSE. I don't see you. Can you raise your hand? Okay, got it. Thanks. <laughs> and I've been following your work for years and it's incredibly inspirational. Thank you. Thank you. And I have a question in regard to, you mentioned the current economy, global economy is producing too much carbon emissions and there is a lot of climate change induced migration and Bangladesh might be affected by it because of too much desertation, desertification and drought in the country. So do you have any um, ideas or measures how to support these vulnerable people because this is not only about poverty anymore, this is about people losing everything they, everything they already have and changing their complete lives sometimes without going back at all. And yeah. it is somehow responsibility to public uh, figures but also in terms of social businesses. In Grameen Bank or uh, in, in other initiatives, do you have any instruments to solve it or are you considering to introduce some and what recommendations would you give? Thank you. Uh, thank you for raising this issue. Uh, so far as the global warming is concerned, it's still continuing. These uh, C2 emission is still at a very high level. And Bangladesh is a frontier country where the impact of the global warming will be directly hitting Bangladesh. It's already hitting Bangladesh uh, because Bangladesh is a flat country. Um, almost one fourth of its land mass is uh, but uh, less than one meter above the sea level. So if the sea level rises, our country slides into the ocean. So that's so, and we're a tightly packed country, many people. 165 million plus people in that country. And if you try to imagine the density in Bangladesh, uh, to give one example, there are about 8 billion people on this planet. If you take all these 8 billion people in one country, the United States, the density that you will create in the United States, density in Bangladesh today is worse than that. So you can imagine how densely we are. So if you, some part of it goes into the ocean and then it affects the rest of it because saline water gets into the fields, you cannot cultivate. So this is the problem. But other countries, there are many ocean, um, island countries which will completely disappear, they will not exist. Luckily they have smaller number of people, that's why we are not paying much attention to them. But Bangladesh is a country where a massive number of people will be affected. Can we do something about it? It's not in our control because C2 emission is, is not something Bangladesh does, somebody else does it. So we have to go back to that, how to address that issue. And luckily we had the Paris Agreement, which whole world finally came together, signed that we have to protect this planet and bring the C2 emission be below two degrees uh, of the uh, level that we have to do, or more preferably 1.5 degree hit uh, that will be allowed. So that then there came the big shock. The president of one big country <laughs> comes out, no, 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 it's a hoax, it's a Chinese hoax. <laughs> he doesn't have even the decency 
to see how many people work hard and what is the explanation, why I'm doing it, uh, I have to do it because of the, he just loves it. It's a Chinese hoax, so we withdraw, and they withdraw. So we have to make sure, even if the US withdraws from it, we have to keep it moving faster than we thought before, because when everybody is there, now we have to do extra hard work so that it doesn't deviate from the path. Luckily, no other country follows the procedure. So they are the only country, and hopefully the US will come back sooner or later. But this is very important too. This is important, and important to change our lifestyle, because we are ultimately the guilty party. It's, it pollutes because we encourage it to pollute. We, it, it creates a, a global warming by C2 emission because we are driving our cars with the fossil fuel. Because we buy the things which are made of dirty energy or whatever it is. So you say, suppose we decide, the whole class here decides that we will not buy anything which is connected with dirty fuel or C2 emission. And they find out what is it. If we do that, the people who are producing it, they will have no option but to shift to something else. So that is the power that we have individually and do that. We created social businesses along the side, besides being, being conscious, making conscious citizens what you buy, what you spend money for. So the plastic, for example. Now plastic is completely piling up to put out in, into our grave under plastic. This, every, every year we throw out eight, billion, sorry, 8 million tons of plastic in the ocean. In the ocean, not the, what we already have in the process. Every year, eight million tons go into the ocean. And it's created a whole new ocean filled with plastics. And it's becoming bigger and bigger every day. Why? Because we have a straw to drink and we throw it out. One single use uh, plastic is the most dangerous. We have a bottle of water, we drink and throw it away. These are the, water. so what do we do? So we are trying to create social business to bring that plastic back and convert it, recycle it into long lasting products, furnitures, building materials and so on. We have one social business project now starting in Vietnam with Mekong River. Mekong River is filled with plastics. So we want to create social business, take all the plastic from the Mekong River, clean up the Mekong River, transform that into uh, long lasting materials, long uh, things that you can use for many years so that it doesn't end up in the ocean and so on. Also, we are talking to the laboratories, science lab, uh, chemical laboratories, to design uh, plastic which is uh, biodegradable. So that those are the kind of challenges. So these are the kind. We created a company in Bangladesh called Grameen Energy. It's a social business, Grameen Energy, to bring solar energy in the homes of Bangladesh. In the beginning, everybody a crazy idea. Bangladesh, solar energy, it's a crazy thing. Don't, these two things don't work for the people in the villages. We said, we'll try. So we started doing that and it became very popular because the sales bid that we give them, whatever money you spend on kerosene every year, because they all have kerosene, so they have to have some light. So we, our offer is whatever money you are spending on kerosene every month, tell us how much is it. Once we know what it is, okay, we make a deal. We give you a solar home system. Every month you pay us that amount which you spend on kerosene. And after three years, you don't have to pay anybody anything. You get everything free because it's all yours. We need only three months of monthly payment, three years of monthly payment, and it will all be paid up. People understood, that's nothing to lose. If you can pay the kerosene money, I'm not paying anything extra, I get electricity at my home. And today we have nearly two million homes with solar energy in Bangladesh. And others jump in into the business because it's a very attractive business. So now we have nearly four million homes with solar energy. So we replace fossil fuel, kerosene into that. So this, there are many ways we can think. It's all here in the minds of your people, what you want to do. And you can do it in a business way. Because it's a business way, you could expand. If we do it in a charity way, we would have doing probably 100, 100 homes with solar energy. Say, hey, we did a great thing. We have some homes with solar energy. Now it's in millions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much.